Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Columbia University Energy Symposium. My name is Andres Moncada, I'm the symposium's co-director. Um, as a Colombian, as a Latin American, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our speakers today to the panel Energy Transition in Latin America. Uh, our panel is integrated by Mr. Felipe Bajon, CEO of Ecopetrol. Um, Ecopetrol is the largest company in Colombia and one of the most important oil and gas companies in Latin America with the strategic operations in the US, Brazil, and Mexico. Uh, we also have Mr. Bernardo Vargas, CEO of ESA. Um, ESA is the largest transmission company in Latin America and one of the main players in the road concession business also in Latin America. We have Mr. Juan Ricardo Ortega, the CEO of Grupo Energía Bogotá, GEB. Uh, GEB operates as an energy holding with a diversified portfolio of power, power and natural gas utilities and serve customers in Colombia, Peru, Brazil and Guatemala. And our great moderator will be Professor Mauricio Cárdenas. Uh, Professor Cárdenas is a visiting senior research scholar at the Center of Global Energy Policy at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, uh, where he leads research focused on energy climate policy in Latin America. Uh, thank you all for your presence today. And Professor Cárdenas, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Andres. It's a great pleasure to uh, moderate this panel and congratulations to you and the students for organizing this Energy Symposium 2021. What a remarkable group of uh, CEOs uh, you have uh, convened. Uh, they're not just uh, the CEOs of three of Colombia's uh, most prominent um, companies. Uh, they're good friends and, um, and they are uh, top talent in Colombia. So wonderful to have them in this uh, panel. And the topic couldn't be more interesting and relevant and timely. So I think um, you are going to enjoy. I'm going to be looking at the chat box on the right hand side. So if you want to send questions or comments, I'll be I'll try to look at them and try to bring them into our conversation. So let's start with Felipe. You know, Ecopetrol is the largest uh, corporation in Colombia, not just the state owned it's the largest among all of the corporations in Colombia, and it plays a very important role in Colombia's economy. Um, Felipe, why don't we talk about the energy transition and the efforts that Ecopetrol is doing in that regard? Uh, maybe you can put that in the context of the energy transition in Latin America, our challenges, and then specifically what Ecopetrol is doing to accelerate that transition in the case of Colombia. So welcome and delighted to have you in this panel. Mauricio, thanks and, um, and good to see you as well. And thank you for the opportunity. And it's great to be able to share this panel with both uh, Juan Ricardo and Bernardo. And uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. So I, I think there's a couple of reflections I'd like to share. The first one, I think that uh, the COVID-19 crisis and pandemia has shown us that we're very fragile as human beings and it has accelerated many things, amongst others, uh, digital transformation, but also energy transition. And the quest and the um, aspiration of people to accelerate the transition. In that sense, uh, there's a few things that we're doing in Ecopetrol. And I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, we need to ensure that as part of the recovery from the crisis, we can provide people with the, uh, the molecules of gas or uh, petrol or, um, or oil or, or the fuels or the energy that they will require uh, in, this, in this path of, uh, of recovery. So from that point of view, there's a couple of things we need to do. One, we need to ensure that we shorten the time to market of the products. So if we make a discovery, we can bring it very, very quickly to the markets. Uh, we need to, um, to be on the path of decarbonizing the, um, our operations and the economy. And I, I, I'd like to share, Mauricio, that there's four things that we're focusing on. The first one, becoming every day more and more efficient. And this has to do with, we need to be the last man standing, if you will. We will continue to be focused in oil and gas, but as we become more efficient, we can ensure that our products will reach the market. And that is uh, underpinned or basically levered by uh, technology and in particular digital transformation. The, only, the other thing is diversifying our portfolio, which means we need to become 
a, a gasier company produce more and more gas which is uh, better with the environment than some of the alternatives. Uh, we will uh, start this year in a pilot to produce hydrogen, green hydrogen, to start testing uh, the appetite for that, the ability to do that in Colombia, and be part of that uh, pathway of hydrogen. Um, and uh, for example, uh, we're starting with uh, renewables in a path to go to 400 megawatts of renewables for self-generation we're uh, committed to planting six million trees. So there's different things we're doing, protecting the, uh, the core of our business, oil and gas, and doing some additional things. And the other thing I'd like to share is um, uh, we need to continue to decarbonize just to share one data point. Over the last four years, we've reduced by 52% the amount of gas that we used to flare in our operations. So it's very targeted. And the last thing is this notion of TESG, which is technology and ESG, environmental, social, and governance. The financial markets, the stakeholders, the shareholders are every time more, uh, I think, interested in, in understanding what the companies are doing around ESG. When we talk about ESG and Ecopetrol, we talk about TESG. So we put technology as something that embraces everything and as a key lever for that transition. Thank you, Felipe. I'm going to come back to you uh, later, uh, but let me go on now into ESA and bring Bernardo into the conversation. For those of you that are not familiar with ESA, ESA is a holding company that owns um, several businesses, but quite significantly power transmission or electricity transmission, not just in Colombia, but also in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And it also owns businesses in other sectors like uh, transportation, concessions in Chile, uh, data transmission, a number of companies, but the core business is power transmission. So Bernardo, how can ESA contribute to the energy transition? How, how a company that is specialized in power, uh, power transmission, um, running the grid, um, contribute to the effort of, uh, of the of the um, of the transition in terms of energy for the region. Well, thank you very much. I I uh, I'm very honored and, and, and pleased to be in this panel. Thank you very much, Professor Cardenas, and I'm happy to share the panel with uh, uh, Felipe and Juan Ricardo, good friends, and uh, and uh, very knowledgeable in this subject. Now, energy transmission. Uh, the traditional system of energy transmission, which is the linear effect between generator, distributed transmitters, distributors, and, and, and consumers, is changing radically with the new uh, prospects that we're looking forward. Because now we're, go we're going to have distributed uh, producers. We're going to have consumers that become prosumers, so consumers that produce energy. And that, in the midst of a very present transition towards renewable sources with intermittent and, and, and sources of, of, of energy, this is a big task for transmission companies. So we have to be resilient, we have to be open to change, and we have to be present, not only to keep on bringing the energy from the basically, from the huge generated sources, traditional sources, whether water or gas, or, or, but we also have to be present in the midst of consumers in the middle of the whole thing. And that means that we have to be, one, very present in the technological transformation of the business. We have to be there in innovating in every step of the line. We need to be present where uh, we have to be digital, uh, uh, making sure that all our equipments, all our assets are connected digitally so we can be present before failures happen. We need to be present in events where the uh, uh, sun or the wind uh, is not present or events like the recent event in Texas to make sure that transmission happens even in the midst of huge problems. And that means that transmission companies uh, have to be present internationally between states in Brazil we're present in 17 states, and there's huge connectivity between the different states. In Colombia, we do that uh, as well, also in Peru. 
but we need to further be able to uh, promote international transmission lines so that resiliency happens not only within countries but through countries that adopt more and more intermittent non-renewable sources of energy and this is very important for the international geopolitical discussion because in the past countries have have protected their front their 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 their, their uh, themselves uh, from other uh, countries coming in uh, to protect them in, in terms of energy and this is a big mistake this is exactly what happened in texas texas was like in in an island there was very few connections between texas and other uh, grids in the united states and that was one of the main reasons why texas had such huge problems but that's happening internationally you know and 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 there's countries that are leading the way the nordic countries in europe lead the way to be able to promote international transmission lines to be present where the growth of non-renewables become more and more present absolutely well this is a very powerful message which is and i heard this before from you at a panel we had at the world economic forum energy integration is indispensable for the energy transition. Because the more integrated we are, and uh, we're talking here about Latin America, the easier it would be to develop these uh, energy sources based on, on renewables and particularly on unconventional or non-conventional renewables. So this is a powerful message, important for the Biden administration as it looks into ways to re-engage in the region. Because uh, supporting this energy integration could be fundamental for the energy transition. But let me bring into the conversation Juan Ricardo. Juan Ricardo is the CEO of uh, Grupo de Energía de Bogotá, GEB, also a holding company, and a holding company that owns several businesses in the energy generation, um, energy distribution, also transmission, and also in the natural gas sector with transportation natural gas not just in Colombia, but in other parts of the region, including Peru. So, Juan Ricardo, a broad set of businesses, but I'd like to focus you on the demand side, since you have a wide base of customers in the city of Bogota and the surrounding areas. And how can this energy transition be um, um, uh, accelerated from the point of view of the demand side? What, what are you doing with consumers? to um, to um, ensure that we are that we transition into um, less use of fossil fuels. Thank you, Mauricio. It is really a great pleasure to be here and not just seeing you again, but among great friends like Felipe, Bernardo and Andres. Thank you. I, I think it's a pleasure uh, to be part of the panel. Uh, let me before I jump into that, follow on what Bernardo said. And, uh, and, and we believe strongly that being constructive in this transition, you need to look at gas, transportation, and electricity transmission as complementary businesses. Uh, you will need to have quick ways to generate energy to keep the system running when you are using intermittent sources of power like solar or wind. And that is instrumental to look at the changes that regulation must bring forward in order for these sectors to be able to operate simultaneously in a more complementary way. And, and that is the only way that we can really bring that change. And gas, as Felipe said, has to be a key element of the transition. Uh, we're not seeing regulations nor messages clear to the public that allows people to understand that while China and India are investing billions of dollars in bringing coal power generation, uh, gas is a much better alternative, much cleaner. And in Latin America, the biggest sources of CO2 emissions equivalent is transportation. We're not the big industrial powerhouses as India and China might be. It's transport where you have the biggest impact. And bringing change to transport requires changes in regulation. You need to bring the right stimuli in order to get trucks to shift from diesel, which has huge impact in, in, on, on, on emissions, to electricity, which is going to take a while, but in the meantime, to gas. 
gas in big transport is there and you would reduce 60% emissions if you were to implement that, but you are not getting the messages because gas as a market is not as well developed. And that is one of our challenges from the point of view of distribution. How do you get people to understand that there are alternatives out there that might not be perfect, but that would work very quickly with huge impact on the environment and the quality of air in the cities. When you look at the statistics from the COVID, one of the things that you learn is how damaging are particle emissions from coal and diesel on the environment, particularly in big cities like Bogota. You could clearly see the impacts on the public health of young children, that their, their problems with their lungs drop dramatically when most people stop. That can be resolved 100% if gas were to be pushed in most of the transport system. And motorcycles can be moving to electricity very quickly, but you have to get the right incentives and the right messages. So that's one of the highest priorities on our side, bringing the city to complement the activities of the company. You know, our partner is Enel. You were a former CEO of these companies, you know very well, you should have said that at the beginning, that, that you were the CEO of Empresa Energia de Bogotá a long time ago. And you know that our key complement is Enel, which is the Italian company that runs the distribution of electricity and the generation on behalf of the Grupo Energia de Bogotá. And they are working very closely with the city in two dimensions. One, creating an optical network throughout the city that would allow the smart meters to come forward in Bogota. As Bernardo said very clearly, bringing the consumer that is going to be the prosumer into the market is key for efficiency decisions to be taken. We need people to begin to be conscious of their use of energy. And for that, for them to shift from gas and, and oil run vehicles into electricity, you need to give them the opportunity to choose the time of the night where they can uh, load the charge of their car at the lowest price. For you, you need significant messages on the regulatory side for people to begin to have prices by the interval of the hour where they are using the different uh, appliances or the, the loading of their vehicle. So for that, you need an excellent optical network. And that is one of the big investments on behalf of ETB and Codenza. And on the other side, you have to develop the network of public transport run on electricity. And for that, you need huge investments in infrastructure. And that one last message, we are having a lot of problems communicating to people that electricity is not a public health hazard. There are a lot of misinformation on the network telling people that you can get leukemia, that you can get cancer if you're close to a substation, that power lines are dangerous, which are, they are dangerous if you were to touch them, but they are pretty high above land. And you need that infrastructure to be built in order to bring all the load that is needed for cities to bring that transition forward. So that's what we're focusing on. And as, as Felipe said, reducing fugitive emissions from the gas. The gas network requires significant investments in measuring and controlling those fugitive emissions. That, that way the methane that might be uh, dropping to the air can be reduced drastically. For that you need a lot of statistics allowing people to know that it's being measured correctly and the right decisions are being taken to cut that out. Thank you Juan Ricardo. Well, you bring an issue, I'm, I'm going to come back to it. Uh, you know, we will need two hours at least with each one of you individually because the topics and, and the issues are so important and so interesting. I'm going to come back to you on the electrification of transport and uh, the role that uh, GEB um, is playing in the city of Bogota. And we can talk a bit about natural gas as well. Um, I'm going to ask Felipe about that uh, because, uh, as you all know, Ecopetrol is the largest producer of natural gas in the country, and we are running out of reserves. So I think it's important to bring that. But I wanted to connect Felipe with the conversation about energy transmission, because it's been public that Ecopetrol has an interest in acquiring ESA. So how does this fit in your plans for a, an energy transition in Ecopetrol? Why, what's the value you see in this transaction and why the interest of Ecopetrol um, in bringing um, uh, ESA into its portfolio? Mauricio, thanks for the opportunity. And I, I'd like to, uh, to say a couple things before I go straight into the answer. One is that there's not one single path for energy transition. It may be different part, paths in different parts of the world, 
and done differently by different governments and countries. And the other thing is that transitions need to be done in an orderly fashion. We can't stop everything today and try to start something new. We need to uh, evolve and basically transition into something in the next 10, 20, 30 years. From that point of view, uh, there's two basic trends that we're seeing. One, decarbonization that we're talking a lot today about. And the other one is electrification. And I think Bernardo mentioned it in spades, you know, in terms of how the markets will change, how the prosumers will have a different role to play. So from that point of view, we see the opportunity of in the non-binding offer for the 51.4% equity that the government owns in ESA as an opportunity to uh, basically by bringing the two companies together, create a more stable, resilient, naturally hedged company that has regional presence. And from, from in that sense, Mauricio, uh, ESA is a company that we admire, that has done uh, great things in the past, uh, in the past uh, decades and, and few last years uh, in terms of growing its business and ensuring that it, it has a very relevant presence of leadership in different parts of the region. So we want to learn from that. And uh, I'll, I'll share something with you. Uh, for every unit of EBITDA, and this is 2019 numbers, ESA emitted only 1% of the equivalent emissions that Ecopetrol had to emit to produce that same unit of EBITDA. So when people ask me, does that make sense in terms of combining the companies? And I say, absolutely. It's about that road to electrifying. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, Mauricio, is to, by providing energy to the people, we can continue to close the gaps that we have today in society and we can underpin or be part of the backbone for the recovery. So again, a company that is very well run, that has a very um, well applied and implemented strategy, uh, a world class uh, uh, resource from the point of, uh, of the human resource. Uh, so we're very happy with that. Still, the process needs to, uh, to continue. And I think as, as we are able to, uh, to talk more to uh, stakeholders and analysts and, and the likes, People say, wow, we understand now the merits of this uh, strategic um, uh, move that is, is, is good for ESA, is good for Ecopetrol, is good for Colombia, and is good for our shareholders. So we do believe this is about thinking uh, about the Ecopetrol for the company in the next 20, 30 years. We won't lose focus on oil and gas. It's part of energy security for Colombia. It's fundamental for the recovery. But it's trying to have this vision of what the, uh, the markets and how Colombia can continue to evolve in the next 20 to 30 years. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Let me come back to you, Bernardo. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to ask you about this transaction. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, so uh, let's focus on the value of ESA um, uh, in the future because uh, we talked about the energy integration, and I think a lot of it depends on political issues, as you mentioned. Um, and I think that's an important aspect that um, anyone that is looking at ESA should consider, the possibility or not to integrate with Central America through Panama or towards uh, the south of the, of the continent through Ecuador uh, to Peru and Chile. But how do you see the prospects for that type of integration and uh, and if not what are your plans in terms of expansion uh, in terms of not just of markets new markets but also in terms of improving the quality of the grid um, so that uh, 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 the, the transmission is, is more efficient uh, there's less uh, waste of energy um, and there's more opportunities also for um, independent suppliers of energy to connect to the grid so what are your plans into the future well, the beauty of Latin America is that it has a lot of, of, of growth space. There's, there's many things to be done still. There's wide areas of population and of countries within Latin America that are still unconnected. And of course, that has a direct uh, uh, relationship with poverty, with education, and with getting uh, the very high levels of inequality in the, re in the region be more equal 
And I think that large infrastructure, but very specifically, energy transmission has to do a lot with that. So the good news is that there's still a lot to do. Uh, not even mentioning countries that haven't had any investments in, in energy infrastructure in the past 12 or 15 years. And I mentioned very specifically countries like Venezuela, who at the beginning of the 2000s had the more, had the more advanced energy system, transmission system in Latin America, and it hasn't done any investments for many years. So that there's huge potential there. And also Argentina. Argentina needs to do a lot more investments in, in, in infrastructure in general. But even in the countries where we're present now, which is you know, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Brazil, and Bolivia, there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done. And as a matter of fact, the interest uh, on the investor side, both financial players and incumbents or, or technical industry players has been seen in the recent transactions that we've seen across the region. So we're very happy. We have a plan that spans from 2019 to 2030. Very specific plan, very well designed, that started by having 12 of the best experts in the world to let us know what their view of the energy world would look in 2040 and 50. We integrated that plan into a very sound business plan with KPIs, with strategies that has a, an amount of $12.5 billion investment across our, our, our different businesses in the region from here to 2030. And that's going very well. Uh, we're very happy with that. So there's a lot to do. And in fact, if what you say about international transmission integration happens, the more. So there's a lot of space for us to grow. But on the back of that, two more aspects. One, technology and digitization blockchain systems to manage data there's that that that's key and that gives us also a space for growth and last but not least everything i've said has to be supported by sustainability we cannot be profitable if we're not sustainable and that's part and parcel of our 2030 strategy as a matter of fact our transmission companies are carbon neutral today and we hope to have all our businesses be carbon neutral within the next couple of years we're going to also uh, have 11 million tons of co2 uh, 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 supported by us so so we, we we become a very green company but we're also know we also know that we impact in one way or the other 200 million consumers in latin america and we're present understanding their needs and making sure that our motto, which is connections that inspire, is present in everything we do. Thank you. Thank you, Bernardo. Well, you brought into the conversation the issue of uh, energy poverty. And I see a triangle here, which is, I guess, the basis for, for, for any strategy, certainly in the three companies that you represent, which is reducing energy poverty that still exists in the region and in Colombia promoting the energy transition and at the same time developing more energy integration. So if we are able to do these three things together and they complement each other, I think the more successful the companies you head uh, are going to be. Let me come back to Juan Ricardo. So in your previous uh, remarks, uh, you, you had two kind of like messages. One is that we have to promote the gasification of transportation, especially for the trucking business, but also the electrification. Yep. Um, and electrification more in the context of public transportation, but also private vehicles. So are, are you promoting this two strategies sequentially, or is this an idea that the two strategies um, can be combined at the same time. You can do gasification in some sectors and electrification in others. That's one, that's one aspect I'm, I'm curious about the strategy of the Grupo Energia Bogotá. But I also, I also have heard you and uh, you're an active uh, user of Twitter uh, on the issue of the transaction of ESA. And I think it will be completely unfair if I don't tell you, if you can t tell us what your arguments are for that process to be more open so that uh, 
companies like yours can participate as well. So what's your interest in ESA? Why do you think it is an interest? Why, why, why do you think it's a, it's a good complement for, for your own um, um, strategy? So. Yeah. Okay. Perfect, Mauricio. Those are very, very good questions. Uh, let me begin for the by the easy one, the first one. Uh, definitely, you should move forward in both. Uh, the city of Bogota is trying to electrify most of the transport, but you need to get the the, the trucks to shift into gas, and for that you need clear messages. It cannot be done in one day. Uh, you need to just give the the long term signals that you want them to move quickly into gas. You cannot transform a motor from from gas uh, uh, petrol to to just natural gas over over a day. You lose a lot of efficiency. You need to buy a new truck that is being built to use natural gas from the start. For that, you need the process of the old vehicles being taken out of the market and being replaced by the new ones. You need the right incentives. And these people are not the wealthiest ones, particularly most of the meat truckers. You need to give clear incentives on behalf of the government for that to happen. And on the other hand, it has to be a carrot stick approach. You have to create and make it much costly for them to have uh, gas, uh, gasoline run vehicles. And for that, the carbon tax that you introduce has to be stepped up gradually for the next 10, 15 years. That, that, there has to be a message that the $170 per kilo of carbon that is a goal that we have to reach that level at some point. It not be tomorrow, but in a decade or two decades for sure. We have to let people know that we don't want those diesel vehicles around contaminating the cities at some point. It has to be gradual. And for the ones that are from the poorest backgrounds, you have to give them incentives for them to be able to shift. But definitely something that must be done quickly. And, and the messages have to be out today, not tomorrow. So you have the time to adjust because this is happening. Now, when you look at the, the, the changes in climate already in Colombia, when you go to the Guajira, the increase on very high temperatures, that, that is not something in 10 years, it's happening now. And when you look at the statistics, you can reach temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius over 30% of the year. If that were to happen, the impact is going to be dramatic. Literally, whole population will have to shift their ways of life. So we need to begin change in these areas very quickly. And particularly, the, the, the trucks are, are a key area. And, and the control of the emissions is really pathetic. You know, when you drive around Colombia, as I'm doing now, uh, you, you are clearly looking how these people are not controlling the level of emissions at all throughout the country. So you can do things now if there is the wheel. Now, why, why Regardless ESA? ESA. Uh, we, we, uh, that, that would be the way to create that complementarity between gas transport and electricity transmission. I strongly believe the electricity sector is going to be a huge winner. Uh, there are expected 16 million kilometers of investment in transmission lines. And to have a partner like ESA would allow us to bring not just from Latin America, but going to the US or Europe where investments are needed because most of the renewables are not near the cities, as opposed to a, a, a thermo a thermal turbine that can be placed anywhere, wind and heat are where they are, no? in Morocco, in Algiers, in La Guajira. So you need huge infrastructures in the next couple of decades. There are going to be huge investments in that sector. And being a, the two companies in Colombia and in the region that control most of those assets, putting them together would make a lot of sense. But it would make sense as well to have Ecopetrol, the Senate part, as a complementary one. Because you have to have all those transportation and transmission. You can make a huge company that is focused on this key element of the transmission, which is giving people access to the energy source, either hydrogen or gas, or electricity. And for that, you need the networks that allows for that energy to reach the houses, the cities, where it is needed, the companies. And having that all throughout the region would give Colombia a very strong company that would be very competitive. We don't see Ecopetrol out either, no? It could be something that the three companies together could build and you would have a powerhouse for the future, which is going to be one of the most critical sectors in the world Thank in the you. next two decades. Interesting, interesting insight. I'm, I'm, I'm going to reframe, I'm just the moderator, I'm going to reframe from making editorial comments, but if I were allowed to make just one, um, not related to the ESA transaction, it's related to something you said uh, uh, in this last answer, 
which has to do with the carbon tax. I certainly feel very proud of having introduced as finance minister the carbon tax in Colombia, a $5 per ton of CO2 tax. Uh, and I fully agree with you that we have to continue increasing the carbon tax. And I hope you support and everyone supports the government in that effort. I have to say that I was not able to include in the tax base of the carbon tax natural gas. And I think natural gas is certainly an emitter of CO2. And there is no reason for natural gas to be exempt from the uh, carbon tax. We were able to introduce the tax uh, on natural gas as it is used by the refinery. So Ecopetrol pays a carbon tax on the natural gas it uses in the refineries and in the petrochemical business as well, but not in transportation, not in manufacturing, not certainly um, in residential use. And I think that's a, that's something where um, an improvement needs to be made because that that was one exemption that makes that creates a hole in the in the carbon tax. Talking about natural gas, I, I didn't mean this to be a topic of the conversation really, but it's so important, and especially what Ricardo has mentioned, the idea of the gasification. And I'd like to ask Felipe, how are we doing in terms of the um, exploration of natural gas? Uh, because uh, everyone knows that our fields, especially in the Guajira, are maturing, maturing very fast. Um, so do we, should, should we embark in a strategy for gasification at this stage? So, Mauricio, the first thing is that um, I'd like to share with the people that are participating today that uh, last year, Ecopetrol invested $2.7 billion. This year, 2021, we want to invest $4 billion. So, point number one, we're increasing our capex, our investment by 50%. Over the next three years, our, investment could re our investments could reach $15 billion. Out of those 1.3 billion dollars are exclusively dedicated to gas just to highlight the importance of gas and what are we doing we're looking at the fields in the casanare so Cusiana, cupiagua pauto floreña all the the, the train the, the gas train in in casanare the piedemonte train uh, we want to produce more out of that region and it produce it basically trans, it, it pr provides the market through Juan Ricardo's TGI tubes or gas pipelines, 50 or 60% of the consumption in any given day. So a lot of, of, of work being done in Casanare, lot of work being done in uh, Middle Magdalena, a lot of work in the continental Caribbean coast of Colombia, and a lot of work in the offshore. We want to drill uh, one of the largest wells ever drilled in Colombia by the end of this year to uh, appraise which is basically understand how big the fields are uh, in Golfo de Morrosquillo next to Panama. And we want to produce the well to get dynamic production data. And with, if, if Colombia has less than four TCF of gas in terms of reserves, this could be eight, 10 to 12 TCF, just to give you a sense of the amount of gas that we, uh, we think is available. So gas is very important, but I want to link it to something. And I, I was looking at the chat Lots of questions around hydrogen. So we're bringing our first uh, electrolyzer this year in through the uh, Research Institute, and we want to produce green hydrogen. So using renewable energy, doing electrolysis on water, we want to produce hydrogen. And one of the things that we want to do is to start testing the blend of hydrogen into the gas. You know, we'll do this with the government, the regulators, and it would be like having additional reserves. So it's starting to use hydrogen in gas. It could be used for generation. It could be used uh, industrially. It could be used for transportation. So in terms of the transition, linking it back to the first part of the conversation, gas is fundamental. It's going to be with us for many, many years, but we need to start looking at some other things as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And I really commend you for, for getting interested. I saw when Ricardo also was interested in hydrogen. I saw some remarks previously. You know, we at the Energy Center at Columbia have the best experts in the world on hydrogen, people like Julio Friedman. And we should uh, bring that conversation. We did an event in Chile, which was very successful. We need to do something in Colombia, but we need government money into this. This is, this is really a sector where there are lots of uh, um, there, there are lots of investment that, take, that needs to be to take place in a, in a public-private partnership to, to really succeed. Look, there is uh, uh, Andres. If how much more time do we have? 
just to make sure. We have about 15 minutes. We... 12. Okay, so we probably have time for another round. But uh, Felipe, I'll, I'll come back to you on a question that is here in the chat, but I want to direct it more towards Bernardo, which has to do with the corporate governors of ESA. Look, I've been in the board of directors of Ecopetrol, in the board of directors of ESA at different points in my life, CEO of Energia de Bogotá, as Juan Ricardo said. So I, I love these companies. I know them very well. Uh, I'm, I'm the proudest Colombian that we have these three companies. Um, but if I were to highlight one aspect about ESA, it's, it's remarkable. Basically, I think the best in Colombia in terms of corporate governance. Um, it started very early with this. The others have followed and have done, you know, great work as well. But uh, uh, ESA stands out. So I think the one aspect about the um, uh, the potential transaction is preserving the corporate governance of ESA. I think that would be fundamental. What mm. would you uh, highlight in terms of your corporate governance, uh, uh, Bernardo? That, I, that you think is fundamental for the success of ESA? Well, you know, it, it's 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 a very easy point to follow if you look at the history of ESA, because ESA in the past 20 some years has only had three CEOs and it has always been a, a government controlled company. So that attests for the fact that the governments in the past have been very careful and protective of, of that. And why? You know, the reason why ESA in the past five years has jumped from uh, uh, from a stock price of around 6,000 pesos to almost 30,000 pesos, so that's almost a six-fold change, has to do with the corporate governance, you know, because investors trust that the decisions that are taken in ESA are autonomous, are independent, and follow very clear corporate design. So that's what gives value to ESA. So if that's the fact, and corporate governance is the basic uh, support of all that, it would be completely counterintuitive for a, a, for a buyer of Visa stock or a controlling state of Visa stock to intervene in its corporate governments. It will only decrease its value for him. And I'm sure that whoever buys it, if it could be or whoever else, is going to pay, pay a healthy sum for that. So it's in their best interest to protect ESA in its autonomy and its corporate governance. And the good thing about what I've heard coming from Felipe himself, is that he's very keen in understanding this equation. And he's pointed out publicly and privately to me and to everybody that I know he speaks to about this fact, this fact, whereby if you protect ESA in its autonomy and corporate governments, you protect your investments. It's a very clear equation. It's very simple. And indeed, a company like ESA is 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 improbable because even being government controlled it's been winning prices in government in corporate governments competing with private corporations for the past 10 years so it's a case at hand in how to do it well uh, both juan ricardo and felipe have spoken to me about uh, following our, our path in that respect they're both committed to that because they understand that within their own companies this is also a key factor so I'm very confident that in the future, that's going to be uh, supported, cared for, and remained as it is. Thank you. Juan Ricardo, um, there's one aspect in your comments about ESA that you did not mention today that I've heard before, which is about price formation, the ability to allow the markets to form the price of ESA. We, uh, we, uh, we know the the evaluation that the market provides, uh, ESA trades, uh, but uh, you've made the case that uh, competition is always good to reveal the, the right price. So I think that argument, uh, I'm just mentioning it because I, I've seen you uh, put it forward several times. But I wanna ask you on, on a separate kind of like related line is this interest in the, on the part of the government to sell assets. And uh, the government still owns a number of power distribution companies in the markets of Meta, Huila, uh, Nariño, um, Caquetá, um, you know, the electrificadoras. Wouldn't that be a very natural investment for Grupo Energía de Bogotá? 
It is, it is. And we've offered to do that. We're ready to purchase those as well. Uh, the thing is, as, as any good buyer, you want to buy some bone if it has some meat. That's why we had asked if ISA was part of the package, it would make a lot more sense. But uh, definitely we would be interested in buying some of those and uh, we're ready to do so. We have already spoken with our partners and we can take control of those companies and make them more, more efficient and, and clearly there are gains from that. And, and it would make it a would, lot of sense. It if would. It it would. And just for for the information of uh, of the audience, uh, the last electrificadora that uh, was sold under my time as well as uh, as minister was electrificadora de Boyacá. And if you look at the indicators of performance, it is impressive how it has improved. So, so the the the. The idea of uh, these companies being run directly by the national government is perhaps not the best one. It's uh, in the interest of what you call prosumers uh, to have these companies well well managed and uh, and run by by experts. So we're coming to the end. Um, I think um, I I like to uh, ask each one of you to make a final closing uh, comment. I think we 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 only have a few minutes. So the 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 briefest you are, the better. So, Felipe. So, a um, couple thoughts, Mauricio. One, uh, there's not one single path for the transition. Different uh, paths will be taken, but I think we need to understand that it's fundamental that we continue to decarbonize and we continue to electrify the world. And some of the questions in the chat talk about inequality or energy poverty, and I think Bernardo uh, referred to those topics very well. Reinforce the commitment from Ecopetrol for energy security and ensuring that Colombians in particular will have access to uh, high quality products in terms of fuels or gas, which are fundamental, as we continue to evolve in the transition. Just one, one um, data point each colombian is responsible for five tons of co2 emitted every year it's not a problem only for government or for companies or for regulators it's a problem for everyone so our commitment in ecopetrol to continue to drive the transition do it through the lens of tesg technology environmental social and governance reinforcing transparency in terms of how we re we report what we're doing and, and share with the audience that uh, recently, uh, as part of our presence in the World Economic Forum, Ecopetrol was the first Latin American company, only Latin American company and only Colombian company, to adhere to the stakeholder capitalism metrics. It's gonna be a journey, but it will provide additional transparency. And I think people are urging for that. There's expectations that we tell uh, openly what we're doing, what our plans are, and that we share in that sense and our commitment to continue to provide energy as we are fully um, convinced that it will help us close the gaps that we have today and underpin and support the recovery that it's much needed. Thank you, Felipe. Bernardo, last comments. I, I want to encourage you to make a reference to something we didn't talk about, which is ESA's recent interest in concessions, in road concessions. How does this fit in the overall strategy? Let me do. Let me address that quickly first, and then go back to, to some conclusions. The the road concession business, which we've had for the past eleven years now, we just entered Colombia, but we've been the leaders in Chile in suburban uh, highways for the past ten years, is key to our diversification strategy, and it's proven in the past ten years the importance of having that alternative to be able to have diversified uh, uh, sources of, of income. And, and that's one of the main reasons why we've been so profitable, because we have a diversified grid that allows us to be resilient, even in times where a business like transmission is hit by regulation, which has happened to us very dearly and very costly in Brazil in 2020 and elsewhere. So for a regulated business as transmission, having uh, the, the, the highway alternative is very important in a well-diversified uh, 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 income alternative. So that's number one. And in terms of the conclusions, a couple things. We need to be uh, dependable. We need to be resilient in the verge of the new world of energy. 
where we're going to have electric vehicles connected to highways. We're going to have a more and more renewables in the grid. We need to have be more dependable and more resilient. And that has to do with technology and to build more transmission lines. That number one. Number two, to do that, it's necessary to involve new technologies, storage, and several alternatives to maintain voltage that have come on board by new technologies, which allows us to not necessarily have new generation alternatives, but have new equipments that support us in the in the verge of intermittent energy flow. Thank you. Number three, Thank you. Two, very important because Juan Ricardo mentioned it, regulation. We need regulators to be uh, on top of this because it's because of them that we'll be able to evolve regulation lags a bit behind us we need them to go to be a little bit more 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 forward and and finally international integration we needs geopolitics and needs everybody talking about this good well thank you Juan Ricardo you have the last word and let me ask for a bonus question on top of your closing remarks can we see Grupo Energia Bogotá buying yeah. electric buses and leasing them to Transmilenio and to other providers of public transportation? We're, we're doing that through NL, and, and it's been approved in the, in, the, uh, in the board, and we bought the first 600 buses last December. Yeah, definitely. And we're moving forward as well in public lining. Uh, there are huge, huge savings and opportunities there, and you know that it's one of the sectors with the most corruption in Colombia. So developing lines that you can allow municipalities to reduce cost and, and to get a more transparent service, that's another area that we're working with NL very strongly. But, but let me finish with one message, and, and just following up on what Bernardo says, regulation is going to be key and is lagging behind. You need to look forward at how things are changing, and you need to adapt quickly. Uh, the times for regulation are being too long, and they are not uh, well designed and with a broad input from people that are experts from other areas of the world. Now, in Colombia, we don't have all the knowledge to get this done quickly. So you need to bring more people into the process to make sure you do it right. And there is one thing that, that makes me very concerned. We're trying to do models to try to understand what we are talking about energy transition and what that would uh, create and, and the impact it would have on reality. And what they are staying so far, it would totally, totally make gas unviable in Colombia. I, like, what, what are the current proposals on how Colombia is going to transition? It makes gas a sector that is going to be one of the biggest losers. And why is that? We're not looking at the whole problem in a comprehensive way. Deforestation is the big discussion in Latin America. And you need to create information for people to know what is going on to create awareness. There are technologies out there that allows to measure the distance from the floor up to two meters. You could tell in real time, almost daily, where trees or where illegal housing is being built all around the region. If you don't create the consciousness and the incentives for people to stop the forestation, that is where the greatest impact on carbon emissions are in Latin America. In the case of Colombia, over 60% of our impact comes from that area, not from oil, not from gas, not even from transport, which is the one that has the, the biggest carbon impact. We need to have the right support to the families that are living on the frontier and to give the incentives to be able not, not to plant trees. I disagree with Felipe on that a little bit, to create the right biodiversity by recovering the natural ecosystems in the places where productive activity is not likely to flourish. And for that, you need a lot of input from the government, not just on the information part and the incentives, but to focus resources in those populations that are marginal, very poor, and are destroying the frontier. And that is where the biggest impact is. If we don't do that, there is not going to be room for the gas business in Colombia in the near future. So you need to act on that dimension. Thank you. Well, I think we ran out of time. Andres, I'm going to hand it, uh, hand it back to you. Uh, it's been wonderful to moderate this. And uh, as you can see, um, uh, I'm a very proud Colombian. And, uh, and uh, part of that is because we have these three great companies and we have these three great professionals running them. So this, is, this speaks great about our country. Thank you very much. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Gracias. Thank you very much for your participants. Um, please stay connected for the rest of the symposium. We still have our fireside chat in three minutes and our late afternoon uh, panels. Uh, thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.